الحمد لله رب العالمين نحمدك يا مولانا حمدا كما ينبغي لجلال وجهك وعظيم سلطانك واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده ربي لا شريك له واشهد ان سيدنا وحبيبنا وقائدنا واستاذنا ومعلمنا محمد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله الطاهرين وصحابته الميامين وعلى كل من اهتدى بهديه واستنى بسنته واقتفى تره الى يوم الدين اما بعد عباد الله اوصيكم ونفسي المقصره اولا بتقوى الله سبحانه يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وكونوا مع الصادقين يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله ولتنظر نفس ما قدمت لغد واتقوا الله ان الله خبير بما تعملون ولا تكونوا كالذين نسوا الله فانساهم انفسهم اولئك هم الفاسقون لا يستوي اصحاب النار واصحاب الجنه اصحاب الجنه هم الفائزون جعلني الله واياكم من عباده المتقين الفائزين الذاكرين امين اللهم امين Oh, you believe, do not let death approach you, except in the state of taqwa, in the state of piety and righteousness. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among those whom live and die upon piety and righteousness. Ameen, Allahumma, ameen. Beloved brothers and respected sisters. It was part of the Meccan culture that when one would travel and engage in their business, and returns back home to host the leadership or to host their family members. Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayyid, a close friend of Ubay ibn Khalaf, two Meccans that lived in the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayyid traveled, and upon his arrival, he invites the leadership of Mecca, the noble families, the leadership, and among those whom were invited was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he invites everyone and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam shows up and everyone begins to eat. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam withholds himself and does not indulge and engage and participate. And we all know many people, part of the Arabic culture, that people would come and present their case and mention their request, and that request is granted. By not granting that request, that guest will not consume the food. It was considered aib, disrespectful. And this is when people had tribal problems, they would come in the time of food and they would hold themselves and present their case, and the host, most of the time, would embrace and accept, out of respect to those whom are present. So the Prophet ﷺ sits down, and before he begins to eat, he asks Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayyid, and he presents وسلم, himself by saying, O oh, Uqba, you are a person of nobility. And I will not consume your food unless you testify that I am the Messenger of Allah. There were different levels to their belief in Allah. So the Prophet ﷺ did not ask for that, did not request that. For many of them believed in Allah, but they had, a, they had different ways of believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
But their issue was witnessing that he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is the messenger of Allah. They had an issue with that. And out of this peer pressure that he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was a part of, Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt says, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa annaka rasulullah. He embraces Islam. He was already motivated. He already knew the Prophet ﷺ. He knew a lot about the faith, but he was always hesitant. And then he ﷺ then pressured him into Islam by saying what he said, and Uqba accepted. Everyone goes their own way after that meal, and Ubay ibn Khalaf returns. And here's this news that Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayyid, one of the Prophet's greatest enemies, has embraced Islam. Ubay ibn Khalaf immediately heads towards Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayyid's house. And he says, I heard this news that you accepted Muhammad's religion. He said, yes, I did. I was embarrassed, but I accepted it. Ubay ibn Khalaf then said, eating with you is haram. وَمُجَالَسَتُكَ حَرَامٌ That eating with you is haram. Sitting with you is haram. Engaging with one another is haram. This is the end. This is a clear indication of the end of their friendship. That we will no longer continue the way we are unless you head towards Muhammad's house and you reject and denounce his faith and, uh, his faith and spit on his face. Under this peer pressure, friendship, the beautiful days, all the memories, what has happened in the past. I can't lose all of that. There's too much to lose. Even though I've embraced Muhammad and his religion and this form of guidance that we all need, but now I have others that are pushing me the opposite direction. And these are people that I've lived with. These are my alliances, long life friendships, and under this peer pressure, he heads immediately to the Prophet's home, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he says, لَقَدْ كَفَرْتُ بِكْ I have rejected your faith. And then he spits on the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's faith. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed an ayah that explains his situation and his state on the Day of Judgment. He says, When that oppressive person begins to bite on his hand, continuous biting, out of sorrow and pain. And he says, Ya laytani attakhadtu ma'ar rasooli, ya laytani lam attakhid fulanan khalila. I wish I never took that person as a companion. He deceived me, he misguided me. He led me astray. But it didn't look like that. It wasn't presented like that. It was very attractive for him that I either lose Muhammad or lose you. And I would rather lose Muhammad. Why should I lose our friendship? And it shows you regardless of the yaqeen he may have had or experienced, the certainty, this faith that he may have experienced, all of that was down the drain the moment he experienced peer pressure. And then on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he will say, I wish I took Muhammad as a companion. That could have been the right decision. But khalas, it's over. And there are many examples where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains that sometimes you and I are moved by the presentation, how things are presented, or the pressure we may experience. And then we become flexible. We begin to compromise. And then we become its greatest advocates, unknowingly, unintentionally, and we destroy our faith, we destroy our values, we destroy our morals. And then you only notice an extreme change that takes place. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran tells you and I the story of shaitan and Adam. And subhanAllah, you realize that the story is mentioned in different parts of the surah for a reason in different chapters in the Qur'an. And there are many lessons to take from each time the story of Adam was mentioned. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-A'raf, in the beginning speaks about how shaitan deceives people, and how he gets to people, and how he beautifies the wrong, and how he allows the wrong to be attractive 
Even though after engaging in it, you are regretful, you are hurt, you are in pain, but in the beginning, you are so attached to it. It was a source of enjoyment. It brought about pleasure, happiness. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the beginning mentions that shaitan is the enemy. And then he also explains how shaitan will always plot against you and I. In your Lord, in your name, in your honor, O Lord, I will deceive them all. All. This is his promise. In Surah Al-A'raf he says, I will be there the moment they seek the right path. I'll be the first one to host. And that's when you least expect shaitan. I'll be there. How does he come? I will come and attack them from their right side, their left side, in front of them, behind them, under them. This is how shaitan is going to do his works. So when you go back to people's, even movements, their objectives, their goals in the beginning, which you and I are no longer aware of, it is very deceiving. It was very evil to destroy family culture, to destroy humanity. But over time, it was beautified. It was presented in a way that it only allows you and I to say it makes a lot of sense. Because people are not willing to engage in the older literature. What happened long ago? How did it start? What were the first steps? How did the lobbyists engage in, in, in politics or whatever it is to further their own agendas? But it's presented in a beautiful manner that a person can only say, wow, this is so, it just makes a lot of sense. And this is what shaitan does, even though we know shaitan is an enemy, but shaitan does not present himself as an enemy. And when we say enemies here, the enemies of one's morals, one's characteristics, one's family values, unknowingly, and they come in smoothly to dominate people's mindset. To dominate communities. To destroy values. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you know that shaitan is your enemy. But how was Adam the first victim? Shaitan did not just come to Adam and whisper to Adam. Shaitan took his time to build a relationship with Adam where even Adam السلام, was convinced to some extent. We all know in the Quran that Adam was forbidden to eat from that tree. But the first thing Shaitan did is to tell him, you know what, you are not prohibited to eat from that tree because it's a tree that may cause any harm, but Allah does not want you to turn into angels. Or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not want you to live eternal, this eternal life. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that in the Quran, إِلَّا أَن تَكُونَ مَلَكْ مَا نَهَاكُمَا عَن تِلْكُمَ الشَّجَرَةَ إِلَّا أَن تَكُونَ مَلَكَيْنِ أَوْ تَكُونَ مِنَ الْخَالِدِينَ Kings or angels. And now he's justifying the wrong act. And that takes time. That takes educational institution. It takes movements. It takes media, it takes lobbyists, it takes government, it takes laws until it is normalized in the eyes of people. And the moment shaitan whispered, it was enough for him to say, وَقَاسَمَهُمَا إِنِّي لَكُمَا لَمِنَ النَّاصِحِ He made an oath in Allah that I only wish well for you. I have nothing to do. With all of this, I have nothing to gain. Can you list a few things that I need to gain from all of this? What will I gain? This is how Shaitan presents himself. It's only to serve you, your freedom, what you need, what allows you to live in this country, in this land, to be part of this educational system, to be part of this educational institution. And of course, Adam السلام, and Hawa السلام, fell into that plot. Yeah, you're right. We are the ones that are going to benefit. And they eat from that tree. Even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given clear instructions. And subhanAllah, because we incline, naturally we incline towards these desires. And so when you add on to that peer pressure, institutional pressure, even in colleges from early on, many people suffer. And they struggle. 
But because we incline towards desires and we incline toward listening to one another, there's a sense of care also within us about other people. And we accept what is offered and subhanAllah by accepting that sometimes may allow someone to denounce their faith and to reject principles of their faith. Because the prophets of Allah also gave advice in the Quran, لَقَدْ أَبْلَغْتُكُمْ رِسَالَةَ رَبِّي that I've shared unto you the message of my Lord. You don't like people that advise you. And it shows you what, how shaitan does it. We don't like people that give us good advice. But sometimes we would rather fall into peer pressure and we know it is harmful. And we let go until we are desensitized. And subhanAllah, you find Muslims that know whatever it is they're engaging in is wrong, become its greatest advocates. You have Muslims that speak about gay marriage and justify it, LGBTQ and all that nonsense and they begin to justify it and support it and go and subhanAllah even though this argument is very foolish to begin with the last 5 to 10 years this is the only thing people have been talking about as if humanity never existed before this but subhanAllah it becomes a central focus you are accepted by accepting it you are rejected by rejecting it how many professors have been kicked out of teaching. Doctors that were asked to leave the hospitals. Teachers in schools that can no longer teach. Why? Because you have to accept this. And it's part of society. And the idea of freedom is no longer there, but it shows you what happens when people fall into these pressures. Alhamdulillah wa kafa wa salatu wa salamu ala Mustafa Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa ta'ala wa Beloved brothers, sisters, we have to keep in mind that this peer pressure continues even with our closest companions. I remember when I was younger, there were many people that would try to make you smoke. You say, it just once, it just happens. People have this false understanding of friendship, what friendship is all about. Enjoying the moment, having fun. And we don't set clear guidelines and restrictions. And a lot of that is due to the lack of self-love. That one has to love themselves enough to know that I have to create these boundaries of who can come in and who I let out. Who has a positive impact on me and who doesn't. Among my friends, who has a positive impact on my marriage or not. Since everyone is here and people are on break and many families came in from different states, who do I let in and who do I push out? Do I love myself enough to cater to its needs, to its spiritual needs, its mental needs, its emotional needs or not? Am I part of a message that reminds me of certain guidelines that I may be neglectful of or I may forget? Am I part of a halaqa? Do I attend Jumu'ah? All these are needs that we need as a community in order for us to grow. In the absence of these reminders, even if at times they may not be relevant or speaking to you as an individual, but they are reminders of one's objectives and goals in life. Who do I let in? Who do I consider as a need in my life? Is it listening to a verse in the Quran? Is it having a friend that reminds me? Is it a group of friends that have misled me? Is it a group of friends that have destroyed my marriage, destroyed my family, destroyed my community that I continue to build alliances with? And have affected me negatively? And a person has to do their own homework. Anta mas'oolun an nafsik. Wa anti mas'oolatun an nafsik. Everyone is responsible for themselves. Kullu nafsin bima kasabat rahina. Every soul will be responsible for itself. And people do not take this don't take this into consideration and take it very lightly. Of how can I be a better person, especially since the year is ending and a new year is coming. How can I build a stronger Muhammad that revolves around stronger people that allow Muhammad to be the best version of Muhammad. And through taking this seriously, a person is able to overcome many obstacles, especially that which is presented to many people in college or these educational institutions or what they watch or the commercials or the music industry, whatever it is, someone that is able to take us out for a moment allows us to reflect and then we find ourselves back but stronger and bi-idhnillah healthier. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among those whom 
realize these challenges. They're aware of these challenges. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to not make us among those whom are heedless, those whom are neglectful. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to be the greatest reminders and the greatest friends whom remind people of doing good, engaging in good, and reminding them to keep away from evil. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect the iman of our youth, of our families, of our parents. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow the education that people seek to be the, the source of strength where they are capable of giving, thinking, sharing, motivating. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to demonstrate the prophetic legacy by embodying his character. Ameen Allahumma ameen. Ala wa sallu wa sallimu ala man ba'athahu Allahu rahmatan lil alamin haythu mirtum bis salati wa salami alayhi faqala azza man qail inna Allahu malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabiya yaladina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. اللهم فصل وسلم وزد وبارك عليه وعلى آله الأطهار وصحابة الأخيار وعلى كل من احتذى بهديه واستنى بسنته واقتفى أثره إلى يوم الدين اللهم انصر الإسلام وعز المسلمين وعلى فضلك راية الحق والدين انصر عبادك المصدعفين في كل مكان يا رب العالمين كلهم حافظا وناصر ميدا ومعينا حرصا بعينك التي لا تنام اغفر المؤمنين والمؤمنات والمسلمين والمسلمات الأحياء منهم والأموات برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين وقوموا إلى صلاتكم الله وأقم الصلاة